Hi everybody, welcome to class um, with Professor Mead. This is African Americans and the birth of the modern marriage. This is the supplementary lecture that's gonna give you the sociology concepts that you need to know in case it's been a while or you haven't taken the class yet. And it's also going to talk about the over, overall way in which you should approach um, learning the, the concepts and information every single week. So the first thing I want to talk about is the why we should do a think pair share. If we're in class, um, we would normally start our lecture with a think pair share. Everybody sits down as they're sitting there. Um, they try to answer the questions before they even listen to the lecture. Theoretically, though, after you have read the article or the chapter in the book, which means that um, you should read casually before you listen to the lecture and then see what questions you can answer and how well you know them before evening, even, even listening to the lecture. So for this particular um, PowerPoint, our think pair share is going to cover what is the marriage squeeze, what is social exchange theory, how does social exchange theory apply to black women's marriages? And what is sociological imagination? What I would like you to, I'm gonna pause for a second and I'd like you to write the answers to the ones that you know. Social capital is the first concept that we're going to cover that you may or may not remember from Intro to Sociology. And social capital essentially means a skill or knowledge that you have that you can exchange with other people in your community, your friends, your family, your other church members um, by being connected to those people. Um, so being able to make social connections and link and exchange social resources like I help you fix your car, you help me babysit my kids. That is social capital, um, being able to cover things um, or cover the essential costs of things by knowing people or having connections. So it tends to be in our culture that the wealthier you are, the less social capital you have and the poorer you are, the more of certain types of social capital you have, like connecting to your neighborhood, being connected to, to um, friends and family who can help you do things like um, take care of the elderly, raise your kids, um, fix car issues when they happen, help you to um, apply for college, those kinds of things are social capital. But you also build social capital as a person by connecting to say your professors and counselors, getting to know them well, um, and having those personal connections with people that can build the community of resources that you have access to. So what did that mean for freed slaves or what did that mean in this article? Well, you know, he talks about how freed slaves jumped at the opportunity to legally marry. I mean, whites at the time were actually surprised that people who had been married, um, slaves who'd been married, um, really were quickly moving into getting their marriages um, legally unified. Um, and they didn't realize that that was something that um, black slaves actually wanted. They also jumped at the opportunity to freely socialize, this created those social connections. It linked their social resources. So they were able to move up the social ladder because they were taking advantage of this. They were building what we call social capital. Um, so what they did was they used the social capital to its fullest ability. They did this because previously they weren't allowed, right? They weren't allowed to have church meetings in the open or get-togethers with their family. Um, they weren't allowed to legally be married, those types of things. So when they did have that opportunity to do so, they took advantage of it and very quickly build, built social capital. The next concept we're going to talk about is the marriage squeeze. This concept comes from the idea that in any given time or place, you have a pool of eligible marriage partners to choose from. But if one of the sexes goes through a dramatic decrease in population, 
um, you have what we term a marriage squeeze. In other words, there's few available marriage partners um, in your pool, in your time and place within society. A good example of this is the impact on white women after the Civil War. And this happened because so many uh, white American men were killed during the Civil, Civil War. You have an entire generation of white women who had limited prospects for marriage. So they had essentially what you call a marriage squeeze. This is was quite detrimental and dramatic for that um, population of women at the time because the cultural norms and values in, um, dictated that women really should define their identity by their husband. Today, black women are actually facing the marriage squeeze. And that's because um, women and men in black communities in America today have quite divergent educations, employment, and incarceration rates. While black men tend to be um, undereducated, underemployed, and are incarcerated or killed at a much higher rate than any other group, black women tend to um, get college degrees, even postgraduate degrees, work in the public sector so they have um, more stable jobs and health insurance and that type of thing, meaning that suitable partners for them and their generation, especially as they increase the education and economic ladder, become, comes to be a smaller and smaller pool. Um, and then on top of that, those men um, who are highly educated, who have, um, have a higher economic standing are more likely to today marry a white woman than a educated black woman. Um, overall, that's kind of the same thing. Highly educated men and men with higher economic statuses are likely to marry women with low economic statuses, whereas women with, low, with high economic statuses um, really struggle in a marriage if they marry men with low economic statuses or if you have a high education and your husband has a, um, a lower um, economic, or I'm sorry, educational attainment. The next concept that we're going to talk about is social exchange theory. This is actually a fairly easy theory. It's an economic theory. And essentially what this theory states is that there's an exchange between resources. That's the economic theory. That's the basis of the theory. When you apply this to marriage, um, specifically traditional marriage like they do in the article, it's an exchange between a male's economic resources and a female's social and domestic services. And that's the, the theory of, or the you know, idea that you have in exchange for um, being able to create that unity, that you are going to choose a spouse partially based on either their ability to support you financially or their ability to provide you with social and domestic services. Um, I'd like you to think about for a few minutes though, as an economic theory, if you're a sociologist, can you frame this or can this theory be characterized as privileged white or a male perspective? Do you think that this theory comes from um, a more privileged white male perspective um, than maybe some of the sociology um, theories on marriage? The next concepts delve into some of the basic um, concepts from intro to sociology. I'm going to start with norms, values, and mores. Norms are everyday rules for expectation. Uh, think it's easy to think about it when you think about breaking a norm. So cutting in line is breaking a norm because the norm is you should get in the back of the line. Um, standing facing the doors when you get into an elevator, that is following the norm, standing backwards and facing everybody while they're looking at you in an elevator, that's breaking a norm. A value is a little more tightly held belief than a norm. Sometimes values are enacted into law, but not always. So a value would be like, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, um, work hard, be a good friend. Those are kind of values in our society. Um, try to make lots of money, that's a value in our society. Um, 
a more is a very strictly held value this is the kind of value that if you break you can get ousted from the society so if you kill somebody or you rape someone or you commit um you know like massive fraud you that is breaking a more in our society a micro and macro so micro is the the view of society or context within society in a detailed perspective. So in sociology, we often think about individual interaction, doing analysis on individual interaction as a micro level analysis. Macro level is the large scale view of society. Um, so that's looking at the society as a whole, larger communities, um, the economics, the social forces on these large, you know, general scales, that's macro level. So a macro level analysis is going to deal with an entire um, large community or society. So if you think about it in terms of like the forest, the micro level is when you get up really close to one tree and you look at the details um, of its trunk and its leaves and those type of things. If you were to stand back um, on a bridge and you're looking over a forest and you can see the whole forest, um, you can see all these different trees, but you can't see the details of the individual trees, that's macro level. Institutions in our society, also termed social structures, these are the concepts that hold us together in terms of our norms, values, and mores um, that when they are institutionalized. So if you think about the education system, that's an institution. Your class, though, is not an institution. Um, think about it on the macro level more when we say institution. So a good example of that would be um, religion is the institution. Your church or synagogue or temple is the um, is base, is just the location, right? It's the place. Uh, media is the institution. Your Facebook is not. Um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. Family is one that we miss a lot. So your individual family versus the institution of family. That's that concept built into law and policy of what family is, who can be qualified as family, um, who counts as family. That's family as an institution. So when we talk about it in terms of this book, he says, you know, the marriage as an institution and what he means is that, you know, it's part of that complex reality of society um, and part of our laws and our policies create marriage as institution. Think about how um, our laws tell us who and who we are not allowed to get married to. That is marriage of institution. The next concept we're going to cover today is sociological imagination. So this is probably the most complex of the concepts that we've covered. Um, the way that C. Wright Mills himself defines this is every individual lives from one generation to the next. In some society, he or she lives out a biography and he lives it out with some historical sequence. By the fact of his living, he contributes, however minutely, to the shaping of his society and its history, even as he's made by his society and its historical push and shove. So what a sociological imagination is, is your ability to see how your problems and your successes are not solely based on your unique behavior, but they are a result of larger social trends, whether that's economic trends, um, norms, values, or mores in society. It's locate, you have to be able to locate yourself in a time and a place. If you were to live in a different country, um, how would that shape your opportunities? And how would you act differently within your society? If you were to live 100 years ago, how would that change things? So when you're talking about a sociological imagination, 
it's the ability for individuals to be able to see the micro and the macro so how the macro level influences shape your lives and how even your own micro level behaviors shape society even as it continues to change um, as time goes on so how's this connected well black american women are rooted as the foundation of what we consider to be the modern marriage because black american women and their experiences in the late 1800s and the early 1900s um, connecting to institutions their new access to resources like an education um, like the economy um, like other women and men who are trying to strive to better their lives um, and how men and women interacted with each other, right? They were seeing each other as more equals in a time where white men and women were still seeing themselves as um, disparate, as, you know, one is good for social um, domestic resources and the other one is good for economic resources there was a split right so that's what we would today consider a more traditional marriage whereas for black women um, in even in the earliest 1900s we're practicing more of an equal marriage or a modern marriage Okay, so as we come to the end of the lecture, like many of the lectures, I kind of breeze over the reading comprehension questions. The reading comprehension questions are the author's questions. And so you're going to get a different perspective and different language, right? Franklin, let's look at question number one. How would we answer this? Franklin provides a historical analysis of African American marriage. What's Franklin's purpose in providing the marriage? You're going to be able to find that by looking for the thesis and where is the thesis usually located but at the beginning of an article i'm not going to tell it to you you need to try to find it on your own the second was what are some of the reasons black women combined education and professional employment with marriage while white women found marriage to be an alternative to paid work what are some of the consequences so i can kind of give you a hint in that it has to do with norms, values, and mores, and the different norms and values for black, and, black women and men and white women and men. So that was one of the reasons why you see um, black women able to combine their educational and prof professional um, employment with marriage, but you weren't able to see that for white women. So where would you necessarily find that? Probably in commitment to marriage. It's gonna explain why um, the black community, what norms they had that changed um, or allowed for a different type of marriage. And it's also gonna explain um, how marriage was different for the white community as well. Number three is how were the experiences of marriage different for professional whites and blacks? And so moving on in the article, you should be able to find that as well as they um, move through it. I'm gonna jump to the fourth one because it's probably a little more um, difficult. So Franklin concludes by asking us, as C. Wright Mills did in the sociological imagination, to see the connection between an individual's personal troubles and the greater social issues that played out in society. What connections have we seen in Franklin's piece? And the author says, think about the micro, think about the macro, the social and the cultural forces that have contributed to um, the, the sometimes divergent experiences of marriages between blacks and whites. And we see a focus on that at the end of the article. You know, we see how the author is promoting um, black and uh, men and women as the vanguards of the modern egalitar egalitarian marriages and how that's the micro that's the norms think about it how they can they 
they interrelated with each other. And then institutions is the macro, right? What did what changed in the laws? What changed in society for black men and women for them to be able to participate in marriage to begin with? Um, so that's going to be your most challenging question.